Welcome to the sixth episode of Smart Talks, where today we will dive into the intricate and evolving political landscape of Borneo within the context of Malaysian politics. Joining us today, a very special guest, Professor James Chin, a professor of Asian studies at the University of Tasmania, as well as a political analyst who will sh be sharing his insights into the Malaysian politics, particularly from the perspective of Sabah and Sarawak. Now, our focus today is on Borneo Bloc, composed of Sabah and Sarawak, and how are these Borneo states, once considered as impoverished relatives of Malaysia, are now exerting their political strength and pushing for greater autonomy. So welcome to Smart Talks, James. Good to be here and thank you. And uh, he's here in town, so which is why we took this opportunity to uh, be with us here, here in uh, the fifth episode. So thank you very much for dropping by here in the studio. So to kick things off, um, Malaysia's political environment now revolves upon uh, Borneo, quote-unquote Borneo bloc. Right. Uh, aspirations for autonomy, uh, resource control, and economic inequities. Right. And the federal government and the Borneo state's interactions and disputes are sort of defining um, the Malaysia socio economy's trajectory at this point. So, um, how have Sabah and Sarawak now transformed uh, from being a relatively marginalized um, to becoming the kingmakers of the Malaysian politic landscape now? James. Right, okay. So before I answer the question, I think it's important for me to unpack each yeah. of those terms. Sure. I don't think we can talk about it if we don't understand what we're talking about. Yeah. The first is that I'm not very comfortable with people using the term kingmakers. Mm. I think that is the wrong term to use because it suggests that Sabah and Sarawak can decide the outcome of Malaysian politics. Okay. I think the reality is that Sabah and Sarawak, we don't decide the outcome of Malaysian politics. What we do is that we help build the federal government, whoever it is on the Malayan side. Okay. So uh, we do play a very important role, but we don't really decide. Uh, related to that is that I think it's also important to understand that this so-called kingmaker role came to Sabah and Sarawak by accident. It all started in 2008 mm -hmm. when Najib lost his two-thirds majority right. and he realised that he requires the support of Sabah and Sarawak, the number of MPs, right. to stay in government. That's why you got the Malaysian Day holiday, you got the additional location for Sabah and Sarawak, and more importantly, certainly Sabah and Sarawak uh, politicians were given chance to be the Speaker of the Parliament, mm. Deputy Speaker of Parliament. So that all yeah. came about because of the split in the Malayan political establishment, right. in particular the Malay political establishment. So that's how the kingmaker role came about. So that's one point. The second point about the Borneo bloc, I think it's very important for us to remember that the Borneo bloc at the current moment does not really exist. Right. So when people talk about the Borneo bloc, essentially they talk about two separate group of politicians. In Sarawak, essentially it's the GPS, mm -hmm. the ruling coalition. In Sabah, essentially it means the GRS. Right. So in some ways, people call it the Borneo bloc because this seems to be the sort of vision among senior politicians in Sabah and Sarawak that they can come collectively together as a group. In theory, they can go as high as 57 okay. and therefore they can go to Kuala Lumpur and exert the maximum concession, mm -hmm. especially in terms of getting stuff for Sabah and Sarawak. But I think before we think of all those good things, I think it's important for us to lean back and ask ourselves, uh, there's several key things about Malaysian politics that has been worrying me for quite some time, mm -hmm. okay? So let me just unpack for your viewers. Mm -hmm. I think the really important thing that came out of the uh, 20, uh, the last general election, mm -hmm. uh, GE 15 was two things. One was the green wave. Yeah. I think nobody saw that coming, even among the Malayan political establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, you all remember, right? Uh, before the last general election, everyone was saying that this will be a game changer. Why? Because Undi 18, you got all these new voters, these young people are progressive, you mm. know, they're not going to support all these conservative politicians. Bang, everything turned upside down. <laughs> so that's the first thing I think is really important to understand. So the point I'm trying to make in terms of the green wave is that we talk about peninsula politics as moving to the right. My argument is that this moving on the right is a permanent move. Mm. 
So the needle is no longer in the middle. It's mm. moving towards the right. I can see this very clearly, even with Anwar Ibrahim government, it's sort right. of moving to the right. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point. I think the second very important point when we talk about uh, the last general election is that the last general election was supposed uh, to put a stop to all the political instability, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking back, everybody went crazy in 2018, first regime change. Sure. We said, wow, Malaysia is going to join the world of real democracies. Then political instability, Prime Ministers keep changing yeah. and the election was supposed to stop this. But that did not happen because we know that Anwar Ibrahim did not win outright mm -hmm. and he in fact put together a coalition post-election. Sure. But for me, the really important thing is that uh, this government, like all the previous two governments, was actually selected by the Agong. Yes. Okay. So if we understand how political development works, we have to, you know, accept the fact that we have not reached that level of maturity. Mm. We still require so-called safeguards. The Malay rulers still have to come in and mm. sort the mess out. Mm -hmm. Because if this is a very mature political system, right, even if no groups get a majority in parliament, mm. they should be able to come together and create some sort of coalition, yeah. independent of royalty. So right. the royalties don't have to pick and choose. Yeah. Because the whole idea of constitutional monarchy is that they're supposed to be above politics. Sure. By forcing them to come down and choose a thing, it may not be good for the country in the long run. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So those are the two important things. I think the really, really interesting thing, at least for me, and this is something that uh, on the other side, on the peninsula side, they don't talk about, is that we are really a country at a crossroads. So what do I mean by at a crossroads? What we have in Malaysia today, uh, after the last general election, and the voting trend was confirmed by the six-state election, mm -hmm. is that we are a country totally split. When I say we are totally split, I mean we all have this idea of what we want Malaysia to be, yeah. what Malaysia as a country to be. Mm. But if you look at the voting pattern, right, who are the two biggest blocks in parliament? The biggest block is PAS. PAS, yeah. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not stating a secret. Openly, PAS wants Negara Islam Melayu. Okay. Or Melayu Islam, whatever it is, mm -hmm. okay? Openly, they said this is the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. The second biggest block is DAP. What do DAP? DAP wants basically more or less a circular state or the current system, they don't want to change it, okay? Right. Islam is still the, the religion of federation, but the non-Muslim retain their rights, you mm. know, at the present state, right? But interestingly enough, you have the third vision, which is increasingly Sabah and Sarawak is being detached mm. from the so-called toxic politics we find on the Malayan side. Okay. So we have three very distinct visions. So how do you bring a country together and say that we want Malaysia to be this? Right. And I think we are at a junction where we really have to seriously think about what it means to be Malaysia going forward. Now, I keep telling everybody in Malaysia who listens to me that, you know, we actually don't have a lot of time left. And people laugh at me. They say, what do you mean you don't have a lot of time left? Yeah. And when I say that we don't actually have a lot of time left in terms of moving Malaysia to the next level, it's not because we're not capable of doing it. It's just that country around us, like Indonesia and Vietnam, yeah. are running much faster there is a possibility, you know, if we don't do anything, make fundamental reforms to the system, in the future, wake up one day and say, oh my God, the people that we used to laugh at, we used to laugh at Vietnam, we used to laugh at Indonesia. Yeah. You know, right, the general view of the Indonesians in Malaysia is that they are doing the, you know, the dirty work, housemates, all that sort of thing, you know. If you have gone to Indonesia in the last, say, four or five years, right, you'll find a very, very dynamic society. Mm. If you go to Vietnam, right, it's a hugely dynamic society sure. and they're running so much faster than us. Mm. And yet in Malaysia, if you read the news every day, it doesn't matter whether you read it in Mandarin, you read it in Basa, you read it in English, it's all about ethnic and racial tensions mm. or some variations of that. And I feel that that is not very good for the whole of the country. And it's especially bad for Sabah and Sarawak because we sort of squeeze in between these two blocks. Yeah. So I'm very interested when you talk about the competing visions because you've actually um, highlighted this in one of your articles, if I'm not mistaken, just before Malaysia Day, right? And again, you mentioned about these three um, uh, different visions of, 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 or future uh, uh, visions of Malaysia. So perhaps would what would happen? So let's go, you know, focus a little bit on that. Um, we've seen in the last general election that, again, you know, there is like a gridlock in, in terms of the outcomes of the, um, the, the general election. 
And if we, let's say we fast forward and look within how many, four years from now, right? And what do you think will happen if you have this, you know, three different um, narratives? It seems that we're just going back to the same, um, you know, situation that happened in the last general election where we're going to have a gridlock again. And then, you know, the, the monarch will come in and, and, you know, try to stabilize everything. So could this, how do you believe that it would further, you know, sort of like intensify? I mean, already we are <laughs> already polarized here in Malaysia, but would it then be polar, um, intensifying the polarization that we have here in Malaysia? Right. So the answer to that question is quite simple. The answer mm. to that question is that Anwar Ibrahim has the opportunity to bring Malaysia back to the middle ground. Okay. So it really is whether he wants to do it or not. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say that he has a choice, people say, oh, Reformati, he has done nothing in the last year. Mm. People are talking, writing articles about his first anniversary coming up, right? Oh, yes. And, and yeah. people are all saying that Reformati, he's not doing anything. Mm. But I've always argued that we need to cut him a bit of slack because as a government, right, mm. you need to remember that he had to put together a coalition very quickly post-election. Right. Right? So he's dealing with new partners. Secondly, right, the reality is that for the first six or seven months of his administration, right, yeah. there was no government in place because the entire government machinery was preparing for the state elections. Right. Right? It was understood that he couldn't do much. You did not want to shake, you know, the foundations or anything mm. or you might shake the vote. So basically... He has a great opportunity now with the state elections over to set Malaysia back. It's a question of whether he wants to move further to the right or he undertakes fundamental reforms. I would argue that if he is a politician of conviction, mm. he will really bring Malaysia back to the middle ground and set it in the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. I will work solely on the economy. Yeah, okay. Because one of the problems with playing right-wing politics lack of a better word, try to be more Islamic than the other side, mm -hmm. is that there is no way you can win that battle. Mm. You can't win the battle because past already said, I want a Negara Islam. <laughs> <laughs> right? How can you be more Islamic than them? Right. There's no such thing as Negara Islam plus plus, right? There's no such thing. Right. So there is no way he can play that game and win. So he should double down on his conviction and say that the best move for Malaysia going forward is a Malaysia that is plural, multi-religious, multicultural, but Islam is the religion of the federation. Right. I think traveling on the middle road is the best thing. That is something he should do, work on the economy, because at the end of the day, if the economy is bad, mm. I think that's going to bounce back on his government. But in terms of the immediate thing he has to do, and again, this is not a popular opinion in KL Circle, is that he has to do a cabinet reshuffle. Mm. It is very clear. I don't need to mention any names, but we know there's about four or five ministers who are underperforming. Right, okay. Right? Mm. And if you want a coherent economic policy to move forward to reform the economy, you really need to do a cabinet reshuffle. Mm -hmm. I can understand that he was reluctant, as I said earlier, because of the state elections coming up, he didn't want to rock the boat, yeah. you know, do, prepare everything. But now is a good opportunity for him to think seriously, work on the economy, reform the cabinet or cabinet reshuffle and really travel the middle road. Because looking back at Malaysian history, I can tell you, it is so obvious. Because if you want to ask me, right, some people ask me, where is the point when Malaysia started traveling along this road, mm. become more and more right-wing? I would say that the first time Malaysia traveled along this road is during the era of Mahathir. Mm. Because it was during the era of Mahathir, Mahathir took on PAS, mm. right? Amno versus PAS, who is more Islamic. Right. And it is very clear, even a person like Mahathir lost that battle against right. PAS, right? What he's, with him, yes. he's with them now. That's right. <laughs> and, and Anwar should know right. better because Anwar was in that government when they started Islamization, <laughs> right? He should know that you cannot beat PAS. I can tell you, I have you know, done research on PAS, talked to those people, you cannot beat them. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so coming back to, um, again, uh, how this whole political scenario in Malaysia would be, you know, affecting us here in Sabah and Sarawak. Mm. You're, you're from Sarawak, I'm Sabahan here, yes, yes. right? So, since the last GE and as well as the last six states election a few months back, um, we've 
seen or we've witnessed the rise of, as you mentioned, the green wave in Peninsula Malaysia, right? And where Malaysian politics has evolved uh, with this sort of new political realignment, I suppose, right? And ethnicity now seems to be the defining factor, right, of, of this, the, 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 the election. So voters' perception have changed dramatically since GE14, as you mentioned. Um, so showcasing a more um, dynamic nature of ethnic preferences. So coming back here to Sabah and Sarawak, right, since we have, as you mentioned, that we have a different narrative, but could such sentiments then have a significant impact on us where, you know, local sentiments and relationship often influence the uh, voting decision, especially for the young voters? Sure. Yeah. So I think in terms of Sabah and Sarawak politics, on paper, it looks like both states are fairly similar. Yeah. But I think in terms of the retail politics side of thing, I think it's very different. Mm. I think what you're referring to is identity politics. Correct, correct. And I think in Sabah, the picture is much more nuanced. And Sabah politics increasingly is mirroring the sort of politics you find in Peninsula Malaysia. Mm. The big difference between Sabah and Sarawak politics is that uh, the bottom line is that uh, Malayan political parties don't have any influence in Sarawak. Yeah. So after 1990, when Barisan National came over to Sabah, they planted the Barisan style of government, especially mm. through Amno Sabah. Mm. So they have sort of a, I won't say a stronghold in Sabah, but you know, after one generation, after 30 years of West Malaysian style politics, right. there are elements of that that have sort of become a permanent feature of mm -hmm. Sabah politics. I think there are opportunities for Sabah's Hans and Sarawakians to, to, uh, basically work on the different kind of identity politics, which is to remember what Sabah was like in the 1960s mm -hmm. and what Sarawak was like in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why I said that there's opportunity to work is that because if you go around Sabah, if you go around Sabah and Sarawak, mm -hmm. the defining features about Sabah and Sarawak, if you bring a West Malaysian over, right, is that they're always shocked by how many people in Sabah and Sarawak come from mixed marriage families. Oh, yes. Right? Mm. Those things hardly happen in Peninsula Malaysia. Yeah. I'm not saying there's none, but I'm saying it's a lot, lot less mm -hmm. compared to Sabah and Sarawak. So in Sarawak and Sabah, because of this large number of mixed marriages, right, uh, although ethnicity plays you know, a role in the way uh, people understand about politics, mm -hmm. you know, because people are from, from mixed families, you can offer them an alternative mm -hmm. and they will accept it. So for example, right, the long going story about uh, Sabah Sarawak is that very often within one family, you can celebrate Hari Raya, you can celebrate Christmas. That's true. You know what I mean? Yes. In Peninsula Malaysia, that almost never happens. Mm -hmm. So there is an opportunity for Sabahans and Sarawakian to say that, yes, we are different and we want to go back to what it was like in the 1960s we want Sabah and Sarawak to remain plural. While we understand, you know, identity politics means that race and religion plays a role. We don't want it to be the overbearing factor. Mm -hmm. And Sabah almost, almost had it done at two very important parts in Sabah history. Mm. One was in the 1960s. Right. Uh, Sabah had a chance to be sort of in a very plural society and back in 1985-86 mm. when PBS you know, tried to do it a second time yep. and that experiment lasted for only 10 years. Yes, correct. So for the first 30 years of Sabah politics, what happened was that Sabahans decided to experiment three different times. <laughs> but since then, you had stability. But like I said, Sabah politics is very dynamic yes. and Sabahans are always willing to try new things. Yes. And people keep forgetting, right? one of the only innovations you can think of in Malaysian politics where anybody tried to do something about, you know, uh, you know, try to balance out the power was actually mm. in Sabah. Young Sabahans forget that Sabah was the only state in Malaysia where you had a rotation to Tuan Menteri. That's true. You see? Mm -hmm. No, you cannot try that system in any other state in Malaysia. <laughs> they will just not accept it. But yeah. Sabah people say, yeah, well, let's try. Yeah. No problem. That's true. So there is no reason why Sabahans cannot go back and say that we want to stop this toxic Malayan politics from coming into Sabah. Yeah. And I think that there's great opportunity because at the end of the day, I think 
most of the major parties in Sabah, including GRS, right, believe that you have to walk the middle path because you can see in front of you what's happening in Peninsular Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And I think if it comes to both Sabah and Sarawak, it will cause really major damage to the political system here. I agree with you, James, because looking at the Sabah politics that we have right now, it, as, uh, when, you come, when, when you look at uh, Sarawak, even in GRS itself, there are so many coalition parties inside. And again, you know, I, I believe that you know, Sabahans are a bit more mature than in politics in this way because they are willing to actually you know, uh, experiment and try and see which works and which doesn't. But again, you know, it, however, if we look at Sabah and Sarawak, and this, let's come back to you know, trying to get our autonomy. Right or in fact fighting for our autonomy based on the federal federal constitution. Since the last general election, Sabah and Sarawak support we've seen that has support for Anwar's um, coalition, and this has stabilized uh, Malaysian politics, right? But with a cost, which is uh, resource and autonomy demands. Now we've seen that Sarawak has been a bit more vocal about this, and. They battled to the government, battled to the federal government for resource control, and Sabah is also moving towards that path. The SLS is going against the federal government for the 40% mm. revenue shares. We have seen here that Sabah is also in enforcing, Sarawak is also doing this, and it's, they are a bit more vocal and they are flexing their muscles now, as opposed to last. 10, 20 years ago, you've never heard of Sabah and Sarawak making noise. Sarawak probably have made more noise than uh, from, from Sabah. But what are your thoughts then on this progression? Would you think that there will be an impact on national unity or governance when Sabah and Sarawak, they're becoming more vocal? You've seen in parliament now that the Sabahans and the Sarawakians MPs have been a bit more vocal. What do you think? What, how... What would be the progression? Do you think that we will bear fruit out of this? And how would it, what do you think they will burn bridges if we try to push so much? I think you've asked a lot of stuff. Let's yeah. try to unpack it bit by sure. bit. In terms of MA63, right. my personal feeling is that I think a lot of the MA63 issue has more or less been resolved, mm. especially in terms of administrative stuff. The biggest item that everyone wants to talk about is oil and gas resources. Correct. Uh, that, unfortunately, there is no way the federal government is going to give that up. And the reason for that is for a very practical reason. Huh? Development budget of the Malaysian federal government is basically Petronas money. Yes. There's no way they're going to give back to Sabah and Sarawak. I think the deal negotiated by Sarawak is probably the furthest you can go, which is that all the downstreaming process from Sarawak, oil from Sarawak, we will be subcontracted out to Petros, the Sarawak mm -hmm. oil company. And I think Sabah is doing something similar. Yeah. I think that is probably the, 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 what they call it, the best that they can hope for. I think the reality of Sabah's position is that you're right, Sabah has been less vocal. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is because, as I mentioned, Amno is in Sabah. Because they're part of the federal network, it's much harder for them to complain in the open. But having said that, the good news is that whatever concessions are given to Sarawak, they have to give it to Sabah. Mm. That is not the problem. Uh, the bigger problem I see in terms of Sabah and Sarawak is that with all these additional resources, right? Mm -hmm you need to build on it to make it into productive sectors. Yes. Because it is so easy to waste money. All right? we, we know it's very easy to waste money. It's a question of whether you have this additional resource, whether you're going to put it into a productive sector for the long term. I think the biggest problem realistically facing Sabah and Sarawak is the issue of human resource development. That's true. And we're in a big chunk of it, human resource development is this issue of brain drain. If you go to Singapore, you go to Glen Valley, a lot of the top tier professionals, are, you find a lot of Sabahan Sarakins there. You, you pro they probably will not tell you they're Sabahan Sarakins, but we can recognize them, right? <laughs> right? And also there's a large chunk of very successful Sabahan Sarakins working in places like Singapore. Mm -hmm. And of course, those who are, may, may not be that capable, so-called blue-collar workers. There's a huge number of Sabah and Sarawakians in Johor. Mm. In fact, they have a tamu there that, 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 that uh, sells Sabah and Sarawak produce. Mm. The most important thing is over the next 30 years, we have to build human resources because that is the thing that will anchor Sabah and Sarawak mm. for the future. Secondly, I think it's very important for Sabah and Sarawak to build a real economy. Mm. 
mm. because we don't really have a real economy. If you look at carefully at the wealth of Sabah Sarawak, a lot of it is based on oil and gas resources, right? Mm -hmm. And those things, for lack of a better word, those things are just you dig from the hole, Petronas take a cut, give you whatever you share, yeah. or those things, it's not going to last for the long term That's because true. one day those things will, will run out. Yeah. You need to build a real economy and to build a real economy, you need a really high skilled population mm -hmm. because it is the high skilled population that will bring in new industries plus high salaries. So it can attract talent. Without those things happening and you, like I said, time frame is very short, next 30 years, I would suggest that Sabah is right. If you got any additional money, go into new areas that Sarawak, they're going to carbon. Uh, they're trying to export the energy to, to, to Singapore, Kalimantan, right. all that thing. Right. Do something that, you, that is needed in the next 30 or 40 years. People said that it's very, very difficult to build this. One of the things I really don't like about Sabahans and Sarawakians is that whatever ideas you bring to the table, right, they will find a thousand and one reasons why it cannot be done. I don't know where this thing comes from. Always very negative. Now, I am a very, people say I'm a very negative person, but people keep forgetting I'm already, I'm only negative about Malaysian politics, everything else, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> but when I say I'm negative about Malaysian politics, I explain to you why I'm negative, right? It's not as if I wake up one day, uh, it's because I've got my reasons too, and I explain it very clearly. You don't have to agree with me, but at least you understand where yeah. I'm coming from. But the rest of, of our, our population, I notice that every time people come out with new ideas, there's a lot of negative flowing around. Right. So I'm suggesting that actually, if you look at Sabahans, one of the unique things about Sabahans, uh, which is something that not many people outside Sabah knows, uh, there's actually a lot of Sabahans who are talented, working of all places Hong Kong. Yes. What happened is during COVID, most of them are allowed to work at home. Okay. A lot of them have re relocated back to uh, KK. It's quite interesting because of this new economy, <laughs> post-COVID economy, right. remote working, right? Yes. This allows you to bring talent back without bringing them back. Okay. You see what I mean? Yes, yes. They're physically based in KK or wherever it is, but they still have the jobs in, 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 in Hong Kong and other places. And you have to leverage on these people. Right. And this is something that you don't see. Right, right. Right? The, I can tell you the big thing, the next round for Sabah, you already have the base if you want to build on it, is high-end tourism. That's true, yeah. You see, yes, Sarawak has very interesting products, but the Sarawak product is not as mature as the Sabah tourism products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The question is that how do you tune it to the up end, the top end of the tourism market? Mm. And I think for whatever reason, uh, Sabahans have not gotten the act together. Mm. I can tell you the sort of stories that you hear coming out in the international market is not good. Like how tourists are being harassed, mm. being handled in Sabah. Mm. That is not the sort of things you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's opportunities there. But again, the most important thing is that build on your human resources. And unfortunately, you can't depend on the federal government to build that. The state government will have to lead in terms of human resource development. Right, right. This is very interesting when you talk about human resources. Um, you know, you will have, you know, you have low skilled, uh, semi skilled, and, you know, high, high skilled. But don't you think that this also, before even we talk about human resource, I think it goes back to education too. I mean, since you're in the field of education, right, in, in, in University of Tasmania. So, I can see, like, this is also the hot topic that has been going on over the last couple of weeks where Sarawak has been really determined on working towards uh, their education uh, autonomy, right? Um, because of the so-called very dynamic policy changes in, in the federal government to which, you know, for example, they're proposing, you know, for states uh, exam like UPSR and stuff like that. Um, and there's also a talk about having this... Borneo education system, quote unquote, um, because we've seen that, you know, our, it's not that we do not have, you know, the, 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 the capacity, I feel. I mean, I'm a Sabahan and you're a Sarawakian. So we are, I, I know for a fact that we do not, we, we don't have that lack of capacity, but I believe that there is a lack of opportunity for us in the education realm? What, what do you think about that? What's your thought? What's your view about this? Look, I'm going to say something that is politically incorrect. Okay. <laughs> but I think the first place you start off is ask yourself, how come all these old people are saying that their education was superior during the mission days? <laughs> right? Now, on the surface, it doesn't make sense. Right. 
Because a lot of the stuff that we learn today in school, right? Yeah. You can't learn in the old days. For example, in the old days, right? My generation, if you want to look for something, you physically have to go to the library. <laughs> yes. Nowadays, Google can answer anything you want. Okay. <laughs> so in theory, the education system now should be better than in the old days. Yeah. Okay. So there's one thing is that you write primary and secondary school education is very important. Mm. But I also feel that the government should also look seriously into the English language policy. Yes. Okay. Mm. When you talk about a competitive workforce, world-class workforce, right? Basically, when you strip off all the rhetoric, all the PR, right? Mm -hmm. Language plays a very important role. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, I am fully supportive of a dual language policy, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you need to bring English back somewhere in the system. Mm. So if you look at the Surat government, what they've done is that they've decided to build six international schools. Yeah. You see Malaysian curriculum, but basically they use English as the medium of education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it's very important that you start with the primary school and the secondary school. But more important at the top end, right? You really have to look at, you know, I don't know how to how to to say this, but you need to build the right tertiary institutions mm. in Sabah, mm -hmm. so that people who can't afford to go elsewhere can still get that high quality education in Sabah. Mm. So in the case of Sarawak, right, Sarawak is a very small state, population less than Sabah, mm. yet people don't realize there are two international universities there, mm -hmm. Swinburne and Curtin, Curtin yeah, right. Why would the Sarawak government spend so much money through Yasan Sarawak to set those places up? Mm. Because they want to offer any Sarawakians an opportunity who have an Australian education. Mm. Okay? Mm. Now, if you were to say this, you know, in other parts of Malaysia, mm. across the South China Sea, right? Mm. The nationalists will jump up and down. Right? Yes. But my point is that, you know, you can jump out and down, but do you want to wake up 30 years from now where Malaysia is the sick man of Asia? Yeah. Going regressive, okay. yeah. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that nobody owes us a living. That is the bottom line. Mm. So whatever we do today, the changes will come in the future. There's a very famous social science theory called path dependent. Mm. Okay? Key decisions taken today, the politicians who take that decision are not going to pay the price. Mm. The price will be paid by the politicians one or two generations in the future. Yeah. In the Malaysian case, I'll give you a very, very simple examples. The people who frame the new economic policies are not around anymore. Yeah. But a lot of problems we see in Malaysia today can be traced back to the decision taken in 1969. NEP, yes. Okay? You can argue with me all you want. It really doesn't matter because mm. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just saying that <laughs> this is my point of view. <laughs> you can go and study all the history books. You know, you can do whatever you want. Right. You know. Right. Um, this is something, you know, I just want to ask this question since, you know, you've been abroad for quite some time now. and I come back very often. Uh, yeah, I know. But, <laughs> you, <laughs> I mean, you, you've been away for, yeah, for a while, yeah. but of course you come back and yeah, forth. Yeah. But I just would like to know what are the perspective or perhaps the, um, you know, the, the, how does the international community see how Malaysia is now since, you know, it, we are coming to it's one year of, of um, you know, the Madani government, the unity government right, right now. So being someone who, you know, work a lot with international communities and such, how do they perceive Malaysia now? Okay. Yeah. So I think after the last GE, I think mm. there was a bit of anxiety among uh, Malaysia's Western friends. Right. Uh, they were very worried when they saw the rise in the green vote or the green wave, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they thought that wasn't very uh, progressive. Like I said, they were also caught up in the propaganda that if we give the votes to the young people, 18, 19, 20, you know, mm. that would change the system. So I think a lot of them were shocked. But when Anwar Ibrahim uh, was given the opportunity to become the prime minister and mm. set up a unique government, mm. I think uh, attitudes change, uh, people's outlook change. They really hope that Anwar Ibrahim, because his government was the only one that was clearly inclusive. Right. Every group was represented. They really want Malaysia to be very progressive, mm. very plural, very multicultural. People don't understand, right? For a very, very long time, internationally, when they look at Southeast Asia, yeah. they saw the two most progressive and the most stable countries was Malaysia and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2018, right? It was only Malaysia and Singapore that had no regime change. Yeah. 
Okay. Today, if you look at the region, right, the only country in no regime change is Singapore. Mm-hmm. That's the only country left. So they always saw Malaysia and Singapore as very progressive, mm. and they wanted Malaysia to you know to carry on this progressive. And also, what happened is after 1975, after the worldwide revivalism in Islam, uh, the West was actually looking for uh, you know an Islamic leader who they felt was also a democrat. Mm. So in many ways, Anwar fitted that. A figure for them, right? Okay. So initially, they were looking at Turkey, they were looking at Indonesia, mm. and then they were in terms of Malaysia. Obviously, Mate can't claim that. None of the other people can claim it. So when Anwar became prime minister, I think there was a lot of goodwill towards Anwar. Sure, but I think you know, like I said, because of all the stuff that happened, people are really looking for Anwar to make really bold moves, right. to make fundamental reforms. Mm. Uh, Probably he has to decide whether he's willing to pay the political price. But my my answer to that is that this is a political price he must pay if he wants Malaysia to be on the right track. Mm. Because Malaysia basically right has gone off off the rails since I would say two zero zero nine. Okay, the thing that really damaged Malaysian uh, what they call reputation obviously is one MDB. Yes. Mm-hmm. You see, nobody, you know, who knows Malaysia well, right, would have thought that <laughs> how should I say, monkey business happened on such a scale and at that level. Yeah. Because they know, right, there was no more level after that, right? You <laughs> know what I mean? Level. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. People never thought that. People understood there was always monkey business in Malaysia. People understood that, but people <laughs> never expect that level. Plus, so huge. <laughs> you know, people don't realize how big M One MDB. M1 MDB actually engulf six or seven countries. Countries, correct? Yeah. You know, and these are what we call very advanced country, world class financial system, <laughs> like Singapore, Switzerland, America. And they manage to you play know, around. Anybody who's watched <laughs> Malaysia say, "OMG!" <laughs> Not only that, you know. Yeah. The fat boy can scam, can, they scam cannot, such an advanced country, right? And they can't even find him until yeah. now. <laughs> no, but you engulf. The top office. Yes. That is just unbelievable. <laughs> correct, correct. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, we, we Malaysia, we don't think about it. Sure, if yeah. you look at the, the, the news that came out two days ago, mm. people say, oh, give chance. He's already been punished. Let's bring him back. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, let's get real for a while. Now let's, let's face reality. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, but we will still see a, a light at the end of the tunnel for Malaysia to progress. In this matter, I think what is yeah. very important moving forward is that mm. young people in Malaysia, especially young Sabahans and Sarawakians, yeah, we really have to push for Sabah and Sarawak to offer a very clear vision. Mm. If you look at 1962, 1963, when the leaders of Sabah and Sarawak came together to negotiate for Sabah and Sarawak's mm. M3 into mm. the proposed new federation of Malaysia, mm. they always saw it doesn't matter whether you're Muslim. Uh, your Conf- your Confucius, uh, Christian, whatever they yeah. Buddhist, whatever they all saw the future Malaysia as progressive, circular, mm-hmm. multi-religious, and multicultural. Mm. I think it's very important for Sabahans and Sarawakians, especially young people, to remind the rest of Malaysia this was what Malaysia should be. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if those people are around today, right, they will all be in depression. Because I don't think those leaders <laughs> who brought Sabah and Sarawak into the so-called Federation of Malaysia would expect the sort of toxic politics that we see on the Malayan side. So I think there are interesting mm. opportunities for young Sabahans mm. and young Sarawakians. I think we need a new generation of leaders mm-hmm. who believe in public service. Okay. If they go up and they say that I want to build a better Sabah, a better Sarawak. So that we can use Sabah and Sarawak as example to the West, mm. the rest of Malaysia, mm, mm. to show the people across the South China Sea, we can be a progressive, multicultural, multi-religious society and still be successful. Mm. Because on the other side, increasingly, right, the people who believe that you know you can have a successful plural society, their numbers are getting less and less. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we really need to remind people that successful societies around the world. Are not society run along extreme lines? Mm. It is working the middle path. Yeah, Malaysia as a country work on the middle path 
from the first independence that 57 then the second independence that 63, 63 yeah. up to the early 1990s mm -hmm. then from there we sort of gear towards the right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it is time for all of us especially Sabah and Sarawak to push the country back to the middle path right so thank you very much James for um, being with us today and uh, in this episode, we've examined uh, the Malaysian politics focusing on the influence of Sabah and Sarawak and their increasing politic uh, influence and demands uh, in the Malaysian politics uh, as well as in the future. So thank you for joining us and we'll keep bringing engaging discussions in the next episodes to come. And don't forget to subscribe Smart Talks Bar on Facebook, YouTube and as well as TikTok and Spotify. And until next time, see you. Bye-bye.